Hey everyone, welcome back to the DevOps course. I'm Saba, and today we're diving into something that happens every time you turn on a Linux machine. We're talking about the Linux boot process, the step-by-step -step chain that takes us from pressing the power button all the way to a usable terminal or desktop. Whether you're working with bare metal, cloud VMs, Raspberry Pis, understanding how Linux boots is one of those foundational skills that will help you troubleshoot faster and build with more confidence. Let's get into it. Let's talk about what actually happens when a Linux system boots up. This process might be invisible, but it's the foundation of everything that runs on top. As a DevOps engineer, understanding this sequence gives you superpowers when debugging systems, recovering broken installs, or automating infrastructure. We're going to walk through this journey from the power button to the login prompt. The very first thing that runs is the system firmware, either BIOS or UEFI, depending on your machine. On the left, we have BIOS, which stands for Basic Input Output System. It's the older standard, developed back in the 70s, and it's been around for decades. First, BIOS does not support Secure Boot, which means there is no verification of the OS before booting, making it more vulnerable in modern environments. When it comes to the disk size, BIOS is limited to around 2.2 terabytes due to the MBR partitioning scheme. Boot speed is also slower, because BIOS initializes hardware sequentially, one step at a time. And finally, BIOS uses Legacy Boot, also known as MBR, which only supports up to four primary partitions per disk. On the right, we have UEFI, the modern firmware standard that replaces BIOS. It supports Secure Boot, which verifies the integrity of the OS before loading it, adding a security layer especially useful for enterprise or cloud systems. UEFI works with GPT, allowing boot from disks larger than 2TB and up to 128 partitions on a single drive. It also offers faster boot times thanks to parallel hardware initialization. Let's zoom in on a critical step that happens before anything loads from disk, the power on self test, also known as POST. When you hit the power button, the firmware runs POST. POST performs hardware checks to make sure everything essential is present and working. RAM is detectable, CPU is functional, keyboard and basic input outputs are responding, and bootable media is available. If something is wrong, like missing RAM or a dead keyboard, POST will halt the system and typically beep or flash an error code. However, if everything passes, control moves forward to the boot device selection. Once the firmware identifies a bootable disk, it looks for a bootloader. Most Linux distros use Grub. Grub's job is to let you choose which OS or kernel to boot, load the selected kernel into memory and pass control to the kernel. And it loads something called initRamFS, which we'll talk about next. Grub's config comes from files like etc-default-grub and scripts under etc-grubd, which get compiled into grub-config. If that config is broken, you might land in something called grub rescue mode, a minimal shell where you can manually boot the system. Knowing how to recover from grub issues is a key skill when dealing with custom images or corrupted disks. So what is that initRamFS thing that grub loads? In the past, Linux used something called initRD. It was a block device image that had to be mounted separately. The newer initRamFS is more efficient. It's unpacked directly into memory, doesn't require mounting, and gets cleaned up automatically once the real root is mounted. Both initRD and initRamFS serve the same core purpose. They bridge the gap between early kernel initialization and access to the actual root file system. But today, almost all distros use initRamFS by default. To access the real root file system, the kernel needs a minimal temporary environment. That's where initRamFS or historically initRD comes in. InitRamFS is the modern method. It's a compressed CPIO archive unpacked directly into memory, so no mount, unmount is necessary. InitRD was the older format. It was a block device image that had to be mounted. Both contain essential drivers, tools and scripts needed to detect disks, decrypt partitions, assemble RAID arrays or LVM volumes and mount the actual root file system. If your InitRamFS is missing or corrupted, the system won't boot. That's why tools like Draycut or Update InitRamFS exist, to regenerate it after kernel or hardware changes. Next, the Linux kernel takes over. The kernel image is loaded from slash boot directory. Grub passes control to it along with the initRamFS. The kernel's job here is to initialize memory management, detect and load drivers for CPU, USB, disk network, etc., mount a temporary root file system so it can eventually mount to the actual one. This is where initRamFS plays a key role. After the real root file system is mounted, the kernel looks for PID1, the first user space process to run. This is the init system. Most modern distros use systemd but you might still encounter sysvinit or openrc in older or minimal systems. Systemd is responsible for starting and managing services as units, mounting volumes and network interfaces, handling logging with journal CTL, and managing startup dependencies. Systemd introduces several unit types. 
service for daemons, target for boot stages, timer for scheduled tasks, mount, socket, device, and many more. Before we move forward, let's take a moment to talk about PIDs, or process IDs. Every process running on a Linux system gets a unique numeric ID. The kernel assigns it when the process is created. PID1 is special. It's always the first user space process to run and it stays alive as long as the system is up. In modern systems, system D is PID1. If PID1 crashes, the entire system will panic or halt. It's that critical. We'll dig more into process management in a later video. But for now, just remember, PID1 is the root of all user space processes. It's the first and it controls everything that comes after. Let's map the full flow. When you press the power button, the system powers on and the BIOS or UEFI firmware kicks in, initializing basic hardware. It runs POST to verify that everything is functioning. RAM, CPU and input-output devices. And once a bootable disk is found, it hands things off to the bootloader, typically Grub. Grub then loads the Linux kernel and initRAMFS into memory and the kernel takes over, initializing low-level components, unpacking initRAMFS and mounting the real root file system. With the system foundation in place, the kernel executes the first user space process, PID1, which as we already know is usually systemd. From there, systemd spins up all the necessary services, targets and daemons until finally you're presented with a login prompt or a graphical interface. All of this happens in seconds, and every step has logs, recovery options and performance metrics you can use as a DevOps engineer. You might be asking, why should DevOps care about all of this? However, understanding the boot process means you can read serial logs or VM consoles and know where the failure is. You can rescue broken systems. You can optimize boot time and automate service startup correctly. This knowledge applies whether you're working on a physical server or virtual machines. It helps you go from blindly rebooting to confidently fixing root causes. So now you know exactly what happens when a Linux system boots, from power on to login. You've seen each stage, learned why it matters and how it connects to the bigger picture. In the next video, we'll shift gears and dive into something a bit more hands-on, the Linux terminal. We will walk through the daily driver commands that you'll use constantly, from navigating the file system to inspecting services and locks. I hope you found this video helpful. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.